So I wondered if you would begin, Jerry, by just saying something autobiographical about, first of all, how one, and there are people in this room who've come to this lunch because we build you as a writer attorney, someone who's written about the law in a way that's very humane. Um, can you tell us something about why you chose to write and why you chose that approach by talking about yourself, which is a fairly unusual thing to do in a book like that? <clears throat> I'm not sure how I can do that. Um, the reason I wrote the first book is that we were on the eve of a big trial. The first book involved the death of 125 people from a coal mine disaster in West Virginia and left 4,000 survivors. And we created a, something which is now called post-traumatic stress disorder. But in those days, there was no such thing. It was the closest thing you had was shell shock. So we were trying to establish that a survivor can recover just as a survivor whether or not they were physically injured by an accident, but that they had severe mental injuries, that was sufficient. On the eve of trial, we settled the case. So I had this entire story that I was going to give to a jury that I felt like I wanted to still tell. That you didn't get to do. I didn't get to tell, and part of the representation of the people was to tell their story. Uh, they, they wanted everyone to know what the coal company had done irresponsibly uh, and recklessly to have killed 125 people. So my father had been a writer, had been an author. So I guess in the back of my mind, I always wanted to be an author. As an aside, the reason I write short and my son writes long sentences is I never took any courses in writing uh, in college or... <laughs> this is not a good uh, pitch for <laughs> education. Come to Penn, do everything but writing and then write a great book. Okay, I got it figured out. Now, I was at the Wharton School, which was a disaster for me, uh, and then went to law school. In my days, you didn't have to write in law school. Uh, it was a memory course. Uh, and then I went to the Civil Rights Division, where again, I tried cases in the South, voting rights cases in the 60s, but you didn't have to write. You put together stories of witnesses and trials. And it was only uh, when I finally got to a big law firm in Washington <clears throat> Arnold and Porter, that I was asked to write a brief. And I did a short brief for a, one of the lawyers, uh, a partner that was well known there, and he called me in after he read what I wrote, and he says, he threw it on the floor and says, don't you ever read anything you write? And, and he said, I don't think you're going to make it here. I vividly recall all this. I uh, bet you do, yeah. And, it's not something you forget. And the first comment was, I didn't realize you were supposed to read what you wrote. I never really reread. Uh, uh, you know, I just wow. threw it out there. <laughs> Maybe you should have taken a course in writing. I should have had something. But how so, did you discover that style? Well, you know, you get forced to it. Uh, uh, there's an interesting part of the Buffalo Creek book where I, I wrote a brief uh, there where they, I was being delayed and delayed and delayed by the other side from a trial. And I finally wrote a brief in which I wrote the word enough. And <laughs> the senior partners were looking at my brief and they said, you can't do that. You can't have a sentence with one word in a brief. And so I did it anyway. And, and I see that Obama now uses the same technique. He learned it from he, you. Uh, yeah. he, enough. <laughs> enough. So I really truthfully never learned how to write. I'm always surprised when people tell me that, that, that I am a good writer. I thought as a result of the Buffalo Creek book that I had a good editor. Uh, and that was what I, how I excused the fact that I had never really learned how to write. One of my colleagues here at the law school, and there's at least one member of the law, faculty, legal, law school faculty here, um, several RSVP, I know that, uh, who said to me that the Buffalo Creek disaster is the first instance where he, as a law professor, got a chance to teach, in effect, writing, but more largely the importance of narrative of people's stories. And and actually, I think the book is used now not only in law school for incoming students to let them know what a big trial is all about, all the discovery and all the rest of the stuff, but it's also used now in legal writing courses in law school, and they didn't used to have legal writing courses. So, you know, inviting you here to the writer's house, it's not simply that we're old friends and that, you know, this is a great forum um, for you to come on the occasion of the publication of your new book. But this, really, this discussion could really be about writing, about attorneys, lawyers, future lawyers out there, anybody thinking of? 
retired lawyers, ex-lawyers, um, uh, you know, I, I'd say that 50%, and there's a prospective student here, so put your hands over your ears. 50% of the English majors um, say at one time or another that they are going to law school. And I believe, with all due respect to that choice, I believe they do so out of, as a default. Because this is what articulate um, people who are interested in analysis, as in literary analysis, as in l linguistic analysis, this is what the family and, and they themselves think they should do. Um, so there is a natural kind of affinity. But what that book teaches us is something that politicians have known for better or worse all the time, which is that when you t want to talk to people about people, you tell stories. And that's what you did, astonishingly. 